first speaker, speaking first will be Rob Carroll, State Forester, and Director of the Virginia Department of Forestry. Rob was appointed as the 8th State Forester of Virginia by Governor Robert Woodland in January 2018. Yeah, this is Rob, This is not me. This is you. Rob joined EOF as an area forester servicing Gloucester and Matthews counties in 2000. He has also served the agency as the first director of the Forest Land Conservation Program and as deputy state forester. Rob has long been a leader in Virginia's forestry community, and in 2017, he was recognized with the Outstanding Member of the Year Award of the Virginia Forestry Association. Prior to VDOF, Rob worked as an arborist and urban forester in Virginia and Maryland. He is IASA certified arborist and has a BS and MS in forestry from Virginia. Our second panelist is Joe Guthrie. As commissioner of the Virginia Department of Agricultural and Consumer Services, Joe Guthrie leads an agency with a mission to promote the economic development of Virginia agriculture, provide consumer protection, <coughs> and encourage environmental sustainability. He brings to the job decades of experience in production in agriculture as a sixth generation owner of a beef farm in Woleski County. <coughs> also 15 years of experience as a member of the faculty of the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences at Virginia Tech. His previous public service includes 10 years as a local elected official, four years on the school board, and six years on the board of supervisors Joe holds degrees in agricultural economics from Virginia Tech and from Macy University in New Zealand, where he was. Is this the highest So, Gary's going to get a chance to speak and address some topics, and then we're going to have some, an opportunity for some questions. Welcome to coming in. Welcome in. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right, thanks. Hi, good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks for being here. Again, I'm Rob Farrell, State Forester, Department of Forestry. So I'm going to give the five-minute version of what everyone should know about forestry in Virginia, just to lay the background. Then we'll get into some issues and uh, what's going on in forestry. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to Joe, and then we'll turn it over to y'all uh, for some discussion. So 15.8 million acres of forest in Virginia. Two-thirds of Virginia is covered in forest, so we're doing pretty well uh, in that regard. And that's great because we're learning that trees are the answer to a whole lot of problems facing society today. So it's great that we have so many uh, acres of forest in Virginia. That forest, 20% of it is mostly pine trees, 80% of it is mostly hardwoods. But the value coming from pines is about half the value of our forest. Because a pine forest grows that much faster, has that many more trees on each acre. So even though our pine trees only cover 20% of the forest, half the value, half the volume. So 80% um, of Virginia's forest is privately owned. Individuals, businesses, families, uh, companies, not really any timber company owned land in Virginia anymore other than a little bit of reinvestment going on, but the timber companies have mostly uh, gotten rid of their land for the most part. We know a great deal about our forest today because of the Forest Inventory and Analysis Program, FIA. All over the country, there are fixed plots, and we have foresters go to those plots and measure the trees once every five years. So over five years, we've measured all the forest uh, in Virginia, and so that gives us a lot of information about how the forest is doing. The one measure that we look at most closely is growth to drain ratio. How much is the forest growing? How much is taken away from it? So how much gets used? How much dies? How much gets blown over? And so in Virginia, we're in great shape. That hardwood part of the forest, three to one. The hardwood forest is growing three times more wood than is, is getting used or is lost. The pine forest, almost two to one. So we're growing way more wood uh, than we're utilizing in Virginia. We also have a forest products tax. Every sawmill, every coal mill, all the wood that comes in the gate, they pay a tax on it and they report how much. We've been doing that for 60 years. Every year, we've been utilizing more wood in Virginia. So again, still growing way more than we're using, using way more than we have in the past. 
All of that involves timber harvesting, obviously. So what's the impact of that? Well, in Virginia, we're fortunate. Every time someone does a timber harvest in Virginia, they have to call the Department of Forestry. We monitor that timber harvest for water quality. Are they keeping sediment out of the stream? And so uh, we monitor the timber harvest until they're done, and then we close it out after they're done. Every year, we take a random sample, 240 timber harvests, and we go and we do an audit and make sure that whatever the loggers could possibly have done to protect water quality, how many of them did they do? It's 115 things on the checklist. Our compliance rate is running about 95%, has been for years. So of all the things the loggers could have done you know, across the state throughout that year, 95% of them got done on average. The last question on the audit is, now that the timber harvest is done, is there any chance that sediment could leave the site and get into a stream? And that answer is no, 99%, 100% of the time, it fluctuates between 99 and 100% over the years. So growing more wood than ever, using more wood than we ever had before, and protecting water quality while we do it. That's how I can stand up here and say that the forest resource in Virginia is a sustainable, uh, renewable resource. And so that's a great story uh, for our forest in Virginia. But it's not all good news. There are uh, significant threats to the forest. Um, everyone, of course, thinks about the forest. They think of wildfire. Wildfire in Virginia really doesn't hurt our forests a lot. We have a lot of wildfires, but we keep them relatively small. And the, the risk to the lot from wildfire in Virginia is more to the folks who live in or near the forest. Uh, the, forest the fires typically don't do a lot of damage to the forest itself. So. The biggest threat we're facing right now is invasive species. Exotic insects, diseases, invasive plants, all of these things are impacting the health of the forest. Just how many people here have heard about spotted lanternfly? Okay, that's good. All right. Did everybody hear that they're bad? <laughs> okay, good. All right, good. Yep. Um, emerald ash borer. Who's heard of emerald ash borer? That's pretty good. All right. So, you know, emerald ash borer is going to kill every single ash tree in Virginia that isn't individually protected. We can protect individual trees, but otherwise, we're going to lose all the ash trees in the forest in Virginia. And invasive plants are causing a whole other series of problems. Another big problem in Virginia, remember it's 80% hardwood forest. We have not done a good job of managing our hardwood forests over the years. In a hardwood forest, there's usually only a handful of really valuable trees. And we have for a long time focused on just cutting those valuable trees and not doing a very thoughtful job of managing the hardwood forest. So that's something that we're, we're having to deal with now. Again, a forest are 80% privately owned. Those landowners face annual costs. Those landowners bear the cost of, you know, of owning land, of protecting land, hopefully of, of managing their forest. And so, and of course, you know, these are forest crops. It takes 15, 30, 60, 100 years for a return on investment to that landowner. So that's a long time to keep laying out money uh, without a return on investment. So another threat to our forest is a lack of markets. The landowner doesn't have some expectation of profiting from their land eventually, then their interest in investing in their land is going to be greatly diminished. In the east, we need new pine sawmill capacity. We're growing way more pine trees than we're using. Uh, so we need to expand our existing pine sawmills or we need to bring in uh, new pine sawmills. In the western part of the state, we need markets for hardwood. We need markets for the lower quality hardwoods that we don't currently have an incentive to get out of the forest. We need to thin all of the kind of junky trees out of the forest to get the more desirable trees uh, to grow. And that's also important for wildlife habitat. So uh, lack of markets is a big issue. The only existential threat to the forest in Virginia is development. Whether that's subdivisions, shopping malls, industrial scale solar facilities, that's the only way we're really losing forest in Virginia. Um, so that's the kind of the real quick and dirty on the, on the rural forest. Uh, the urban forest is also very important. Um, again, we're learning lots of ways the trees make our lives better, especially uh, in urban areas. Our urban forests, while we recognize the importance of trees, uh, for the most part, our urban forests are going in the wrong direction. 
We are not gaining trees and gaining capacity, gaining canopy cover. We are losing trees in most of our urban areas. Um, so we're losing the benefits uh, that we should be gaining from trees. And here again, you know, lack of intentional planning. You know, we are developing places without thinking about how do we incorporate nature into the development. Then we're trying to add nature back in at the end, stick trees wherever we can fit them afterwards. In our established communities, we're not investing in tree maintenance, so our trees don't live as long. They don't provide the level of benefits that they could. Uh, so again, just a, a lack of, of thought about what our trees can do for us. We're also learning that there is a very direct relationship between where communities have the fewest trees and where folks are in underserved communities. So there is a direct link to being you know, poor underserved communities and having even less tree canopy and even more health impacts uh, from not having that tree canopy there. The good news again is we are starting to recognize trees are the answer. There's a whole lot we can do with trees to start solving uh, problems that are facing us. And a lot of great things are happening. I've, again, I've been in leadership of the Department of Forestry for 10 years now. I've never seen anything like uh, what's been going on in the last few years when it comes to trees and forestry. I uh, would like to recognize VACO's help um, in this past General Assembly session with the uh, creation of the Forest Sustainability Fund. Uh, this was legislation passed by Delegate Bloxham and Senator Ruff. Um, how many people here have heard about the Forest Sustainability Fund? Hey, not enough. We've got to work on that. So this is just this is the first year. Forest Sustainability Fund is General Assembly funding to reimburse localities for the money that was the tax revenue that is deferred to forest land use. So the, it was funded with a million dollars this year. We started out by doing a survey of all localities. We got really good response uh, to determine how much total revenue is being lost due to uh, forest land use. And right now, I think it's due like tomorrow or the next day, and localities can request reimbursement for a portion of uh, the foregone revenue from forest land use. So this is the General Assembly recognizing the value that forests provide to society, recognizing that landowners are the ones bearing the cost for those benefits. <coughs> and that localities are assisting landowners by deferring income on that. So it's society recognizing the benefits of what forest landowners are providing us. Uh, thanks, Delegate Adams. We also got a hard for tax credit in this past General Assembly. Again, helping landowners understanding that it's a long-term uh, return on investment for anything you do to help your hardwood forest. So there's a, a tax credit to help landowners manage hardwood forests. Economic development work, again, we're focused on, we need Increase pine saw mills. Pine saw mills are really big. You got to move a lot of logs through a pine saw mill to be efficient these days. So this is one of the places where Virginia's lack of large industrial sites is really hurting us. They are looking for big footprints in southern and eastern Virginia, and that's I think where we've lost some opportunities there uh, to get a big sawmill. In the western part of the state, in the hardwood forest. We need markets for lots of, again, smaller trees to thin them out of the forest. We're looking at ways to chip them up, use them for energy. We can actually, somehow, somebody can turn them into <coughs> aviation fuel. So we're really pushing on trying to get aviation fuel refineries in the western part of the state uh, to help us with our, our hardwoods. So the loss of, of farm and forest land, I think everyone here is aware of the issues related to utility scale solar. Um, a lot of that is happening uh, on, on farms as, as well as forests. The challenge is these things, you know, we're looking at 4,000 acres, 6,000 acres, 10,000 acres. You can't mitigate 6,000 acres of forest loss. There's no other landscape to put it back on. You, you, there's just no landscape left of that scale so it's a it's a significant challenge um, in my mind you know as a society we're just going to have to accept that if we're going to have this much solar we're going to have less farm and forest and, and that's just a decision that apparently we're, we're, we're making i think future generations are going to look back at us and say wow green energy that involved deforestation just doesn't seem like that makes a lot of sense, but that's just a forest problem. 
Um, so uh, another thing we're working on is how to increase our urban tree canopy. So again, go into those places where we don't have enough tree canopy, where it's impacting human health, and, and get more trees into those places this year. Um, Again, a lot of interest in the General Assembly, Delegate Fulva, Delegate Hodges, Delegate Hope, Senator Marsden. Um, we're <coughs> a, trying to get a stakeholder process going to balance the needs of private landowners and developers to conserve trees during development, and then also looking at how do we help communities invest more in their trees. Everyone agrees. More trees is better in most places. Uh, we need more trees to protect the Chesapeake Bay. Again, we need more trees to address urban heat islands in our uh, cities. Um, we need more trees to offset uh, storm runoff. So lots of need for trees. This year, the General Assembly uh, provided uh, the Department of Forestry $4 million in water quality improvement funds over the biennium. This is a huge increase in what we've had before. So we are going to be able to greatly increase our funding to communities to plant trees, uh, as well as the planning to get those trees in the right places. Uh, we're also setting up some other programs. One of the things that I'm most excited about is, you know, when we talk about getting more trees in urban areas, most of my foresters did not grow up in urban areas. We are foresters because we grew up spending a lot of time in the forest. So we're probably not the best people to go into heavily developed urban areas and say, here's where a tree should go and here's the kind of tree you should have. So we're really gonna focus on finding folks within the community who can help us decide what trees, where do they go, how are they going to get maintained, who's going to be responsible for them. So I'm really excited to bring natural resources into the urban areas, and, and I think we're going to get a whole lot more people interested in the natural resources that way. The really big news is increased federal funding. A lot of infrastructure money is going to forestry. There's one and a half billion dollars nationwide going to urban and community forestry. And so communities are being reached out to right now by lots of people who want to get that one and a half billion dollars and help communities. Uh, so the Department of Forestry, we are certainly reaching out to the communities that we work with. Uh, the uh, Forest Foundation, American Forest, there's a lot of folks, Arbor Day Foundation. We're trying to figure out how we're going to get this money out to communities. So if you haven't heard from someone about urban forestry money, you will. Um, I feel like in Virginia, we've got a great program in place, so we're really well situated to get that money distributed to the communities that we work with in Virginia. So I think we're gonna do really well um, by getting our share of that one and a half billion dollars and getting it spent well. So I just talked about forestry for hopefully just 15 minutes, and I didn't mention carbon. We'll leave that for the rest of the discussion. I won't take up any more Joe's time. So uh, thank you all. Look forward to the discussion. <clears throat> you can see that one of the great things about uh, my job as commissioner is that I get to work with people like Rob uh, and uh, you know someone that comes at uh, his uh, position um, and leading his agency uh, so well, so thoroughly, and so so knowledgeably, and it's been a delight for me to begin uh, this year working working with Rob as well as with Secretary Lohr, uh as commissioner. So, but a bigger delight for me is to be with you here at Vega uh, today uh, at your convention. And as Terry mentioned in my introduction, uh, I was a member of the Board of Supervisors in my native Pulaski County. Uh, for six years uh, before resigning uh, two years into my second term when Governor Youngkin uh, appointed me to be Commissioner of VDAX. And you all in this room know better than anybody uh, the amount of work it takes to get elected to a four-year term and that you don't give that up easily. Uh, and, and I certainly didn't, uh, along with uh, a position that I really enjoy uh, teaching uh, at the, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at Virginia Tech. Um, but it was an opportunity to be part of Governor Youngkin's team as administration to help him accomplish his agenda uh, to make Virginia the best place it can be to live, work, and raise a family and also to work with people uh, like Rob and like Secretary Lohr. And uh, that made it an easy decision. Um, but through those six years, I've been no stranger to Baco and I've always appreciated 
uh, the great work uh, that Dean and Jeremy and, and all the folks here at VACO do, and uh, really appreciate that. So uh, this is actually, I've attended all the VACO conventions as a supervisor, so this is my seventh in a row. Uh, thank you guys for helping me to keep the streak alive, even though I'm not a supervisor anymore. Uh, I've got a soft spot in my heart for VACO, and Jeremy knows this, I, I, I cannot say no when VACO asked me to speak. Been at some uh, regional meetings as well, uh, so particularly if you're in a rural community and, and we can ever uh, do anything for you uh, from VDAX or me or come and speak to a group, uh, please let us know. And, and we're happy to have done that several times over the past year. Um, as Commissioner VDAX, uh, I do often get to tout the fact that agriculture is Virginia's largest private industry. Forestry, running a decent third. Not bad, Bob. Not bad. Not bad. Agriculture is one, forestry is three. So within the Secretary of Agriculture and Forestry, which Rob and I represent, we have by far the largest industries in Virginia, representing somewhere around 10% of Virginia's GDP just between agriculture and forestry. And as Rob pointed out, a uh, tremendous uh, amount of the percentage of land use in Virginia, and that's very important to those uh, of you who are, who are directing uh, the, the leadership in counties. Uh, we have an economic impact in agriculture of about $70 billion a year of economic impact. Forestry adds about another 21, giving us about $91 billion altogether. Each job in these industries supports about one and three quarters jobs elsewhere. That's things you know that, that might be of interest to you, school teachers, sheriff's deputies, things like that, that are uh, you know, multiplier effects uh, in rural communities. So uh, we we're currently in the midst of, of doing a new economic impact study with the Loving Cooper Center. Uh, so the most recent data I have is from our last uh, long-term plan, which was in 2017. Uh, but then uh, our production agriculture alone, what you and I might just call farming, uh, employed about 50,000 uh, Virginians, about $4 billion in direct revenue. About 80% of Virginia's farms are part-time farms and have less than half of their income from the farm, which means that that, that farm needs more off-farm income, uh, what we in, in farming call a job in town, uh, and that just points out the need for good jobs and economic development in rural communities and how that actually benefits uh, farms as well. Value-added industries, those that depend on farm commodities, processing, for example, uh, they add another 69,000 jobs and add over $38 billion in economic impact. Other industries, about another 220,000 jobs and another $28 billion uh, in, in things further along the line in food. Um, and uh, when we add all that together, again, it's about 10% of the state's GDP. Uh, in addition to the tangible benefits, uh, such as farm cash receipts and jobs, agriculture provides many intangible benefits, as we all know. Things like recreation, agricultural tourism, wildlife habitat, biodiversity, flood mitigation, uh, improved water quality, soil stabilization, and increasingly importantly, carbon sequestration. And I think a lot of that could also be said of our forestry industry as well. Um, Virginia's agricultural production is one of the most diverse in the nation. When I was teaching at Tech, I thought it would have been a whole lot simpler if I had just gotten a job at Kansas State. All you have to know is wheat and cattle. Uh, in Virginia, it's a lot more than that. Uh, we've got everything from cotton and peanuts and soybeans and row crops in the eastern part of the state up to a very diverse uh, amount of agriculture in the Piedmont region. That's a, a mixture of, of crops, livestock. You mix in specialty crops like uh, fruit and grapes. And then in the western part of the state, west of the Blue Ridge, primarily a livestock focus, beef and dairy, also, also some sheep and some other uh, species there as well, but also uh, a robust uh, uh, a row crop and, um, and also specialty crop industry all around Virginia. If you ask me if I had to choose one place in the world uh, to live and I could eat only local foods grown in that place, where would I live? The answer would be Virginia. Uh, what are some of the things that, that we do well here and do a lot of here? Uh, broilers, turkeys, we're one of the leaders in the nation in, in the poultry industry. Uh, also way up there in things like uh, tobacco, uh, peanuts, uh, grapes. Uh, we were recently ranked one of the top five states in the country in terms of quality in wine. Uh, and grapes and wine are a growing industry uh, in Virginia. Uh, we are 12th in beef cattle. 
which is pretty good for a, a state no bigger uh, than we are. Beef is our largest single employer in agriculture and our largest single land use as well. Most of it, of course, being in the uh, west of 95. Uh, we're also third in the nation. Don't want to overlook uh, our seafood industry. We're third in the nation and first on the East Coast in terms of seafood landings, oysters uh, in particular, also clams, uh, crabs, and, uh, and other seafood as well, including uh, finfish. Um, for exports, soybean, soybean oil, soybean meal make up the largest segment of our exports, agriculture and forestry exports, accounted for over $4 billion last year. That's up 30% from 2020 and up over 50% uh, from as recently as 2017. And by volume, ag and forestry accounted for more than half of the containerized exports in the Port of Virginia. So uh, about 40% of our exports uh, uh, are, are going to, uh, agriculture and forestry exports are going to China. Our other top trade partners are Canada, Japan, Taiwan, and Mexico. Uh, our farms cover about 7.8 million acres. We have about 43,200 farms. Uh, that averages out to be about, about 180 acres per farm. I uh, don't want to dwell too much on the average uh, because we have farms of a great amount of diversity of size. We do have a lot of small farms, again, part-time farms, uh, that are not big enough to support uh, a family, but add uh, income and enjoyment to and, and lifestyle uh, to a lot of folks in rural areas. The average farmer is about 58 years old. Uh, I delight in the fact that I'm still a young farmer and that number keeps inching up. So I've still stayed a young farmer uh, even all these years. Um, it takes about, we think, somewhere around a thousand acres or so, it looks like, uh, to have a farm large enough to sustain a family income, whether it be row crop or livestock. So a lot of our, a lot of our farms are, again, not supporting full-time agriculture, uh, but those that are tend to be very, very large farms. We've seen a lot of consolidation in farms. So we're seeing not only a decline in the number of acres of farms, but the number of farms, but a lot of that is consolidation as we have fewer farmers, uh, but, uh, but more larger farms. Um, and throughout our Virginia history, farming and forestry have been central to our culture uh, and to our state's residents. Uh, we have in agriculture sustained uh, the people of Virginia uh, by providing food, fiber, and energy in addition to vital economic, industrial, uh, environmental, aesthetic, and social benefits. <laughs> now, with a land area, do a little math for you for a minute. With a land area in Virginia about 40,000 square miles, there's 640 acres in a square mile. I did the math, it's about 25 million acres. Well, we got 15 million of that is in force, okay? Uh, and in Virginia, throughout most of our history, most of that 25 million acres has been land devoted to forest and farmland. Uh, as recently as 1960, uh, about half of those acres uh, remained in farmland, but by 2010, we were down to about 8.3 million. We lost, in other words, about 5 million acres of farmland in 50 years between 1960 and 2010, during a period of time when Virginia's population doubled from 4 million to 8 million people. Those people had to go somewhere, residential development, jobs, economic development, roads, we get it. A great place to put that is some of our best farmland. Uh, and so we have a lot of encroachment going on into farmland and, and a declining amount of farmland. As we've seen increased population, we see no reason why that trend uh, is going to uh, stop, although we are looking for ways in which we can mitigate that with smarter growth. Uh, so by, by now, we've got about 7.8 million acres left in farming in, in Virginia, down about 500,000 acres in the past 12 years. Um, times have changed uh, for us, but the need for farm and forest land and the businesses they support has not diminished. So we in VDACs do have an Office of Farmland Preservation. It was established in 2001 by an act of the General Assembly. Some of you may work with us in that uh, as we try to use processes to slow uh, or reverse the trend of uh, declining amounts of farmland. We work, for example, with government and private organizations to establish 
uh, PDRs, Purchase of Development Rights Programs, assist local governments in developing additional farmland, uh, preservation policies and programs, educate the public about farmland preservation, help farmers with farmland preservation efforts, and we also help to administer the Virginia Farm Link Program, which tries to link up farmers with uh, potential new owners if the farmers don't have heirs of their own uh, to inherit the land and continue it in farming. Um, now, uh, we were doing about, in 2019, we got some skewed statistics during COVID, of course. We were doing about $630,000 a year in state matching funds for uh, several local PDR programs in several counties. Uh, and our office has worked with PDR programs to permanently preserve thousands of acres of forest and farmlands in several localities and continues to do outreach activities uh, in a variety of ways. So. We have less farmland in Virginia, and that's following a trend around the U.S. in general as our population increases, but we're not starving. So what happened? We got more productive with the land we have left, right? Uh, that, was, that was made very apparent to me as I was reading an, an article in a dairy magazine uh, a few weeks ago uh, that, was doing, that showed a budget for a dairy farm from 1947, I found it interesting looking, you know, how you look back at the prices of something from way back in time, look at the difference then and now. The cost structure for the dairy farm wasn't much different than it is now. The revenue was, but the cost wasn't. It struck me as very odd. Couldn't figure it out at first. Why is it that the costs were almost as high then as they are now to produce 100 pounds of milk? It's based on a budget of 100 pounds of milk. I couldn't figure it out until I realized this. They were budgeting for five days to produce 100 pounds of milk. Today, an average cow, an average cow will produce over 100 pounds of milk in one day. A cow today can produce as much milk in one day as a cow in my father's generation can produce in a week. It's amazing. It's amazing what we've done. My father, I'm one generation removed from someone who was farming with a horse. Many of you are too. One generation, my father walked behind a horse that was pulling a plow until he was 18 years old, Bob Trafford, 1943. Walk behind a horse that's pulling a plow. By the time I was starting with him, he was driving a tractor that had 125 horsepower to it pulling a plow. By the time I inherited the farm from him, we weren't pulling a plow anymore. We quit pulling plows because we were using no-till as a conservation method for our soil. Quit using them. I think I know where that plow is. I'm not quite sure. But I think if I look back in the weeds far enough, I could probably still find that plow. I haven't used it in years. Because plows provide opportunity for erosion, and we mitigate that by using no-till methods. Those no-till methods, though, are based on modern innovations such as herbicides and other crop protectants uh, that make it possible to have weed control uh, without tillage. Those are just some of the examples uh, of how we've become more productive and efficient in farming, and we've seen, along with that, because of economies of scale, a declining number of farms and increased consolidation. Uh, there has been, in fact, probably more innovation and advancement in production agriculture in the past 100 years than there have been in any 100 years prior to that and maybe in all of human history combined. Uh, today, what we call precision agriculture has become commonplace <coughs> in row crop farming in Virginia and throughout the nation. Autonomous auto steer tractors pull planters and sprayers that can vary the types and rates of seeds, fertilizer, chemicals to match the soil types in precisely satellite mapped fields, greatly reducing costly inputs. Drones perform advanced imaging of crops, numerous other duties around the farm. In fact, agriculture is in many ways on the leading edge of technological advancements. The Yonkin administration uh, is highly supportive of what we call best management practices in farms, practices that help to preserve soil and reduce water pollution by, for example, providing funding for cover crops. Now, cover crops are those that are put out but are not harvested because they're helping to hold the soil uh, during winter months. There's no revenue stream for the farmer for harvesting that, but there is a cost involved. We help to offset the cost of that. That's a societal good. Uh, that helps the farmer but also helps society. So part of that cost we help to bear uh, with public funding. Uh, they provide great long-term benefits of soil conservation and water quality improvements. 
Uh, and that really helps us in particular in our Chesapeake Bay watershed. But it provides a better environment for us no matter where we are and also helps to provide carbon sequestration. The administration is also very enthusiastic about another type of technological advancement in agriculture and bringing more of it to Virginia, what is broadly described as controlled environment agriculture. Uh, now, this could be more conventional type greenhouse. We have a very large one in my native Glasgow County. That's it's built on a farm uh, where, where I, used to, I used to cut for hay. Uh, and that's great. Uh, I love the fact that it's now producing a lot of tomatoes. Uh, about 20 acres of tomatoes under roof. Controlled environment agriculture, hydroponic, very efficient. Um, but there are new innovations in controlled environment agriculture as well. Um, and we, we, and we, we've had several of them come into Virginia. Um, uh, we have indoor vertical farming facility using artificial light like air farms in Danville. Uh, and we also recently announced what will be the nation's largest uh, uh, complex of controlled environment agriculture will be in Chesterfield County, a San Francisco Bay Area company called Plenty Incorporated, putting $300 million investment into an indoor agriculture center that will produce more per acre under roof than 35 conventional acres. Now most of this will also be crops that we don't have a lot of in Virginia. Raising small greens, for example, uh, lettuce is a good example of what some of these are doing. Crops that are currently being raised in California, where we've got a lot of environmental problems, including uh, you know, a real lack of water that we've seen in recent years there. And how can we bring these crops to the east, uh, closer to our markets, and also raise them 12 months out of the year? It's really exciting stuff. We're going to be seeing more of that. We're very enthusiastic about bringing more of those. Um, and to help with that, we have used, in some cases, startup money uh, needed for expansion from Virginia's unique AFID program. AFID is Agriculture and Forestry Industrial Development Grants. Uh, that's administered by VDACs. Many of you are aware of AFID. Many of you have participated in an AFID grant program. Uh, since its features uh, re uh, require a match from the local government, uh, it was started 10 years ago to provide agricultural businesses the same economic development incentives that other industries enjoy with Commonwealth Opportunity Funds. AFID has been a great success in creating and expanding agricultural businesses uh, and agricultural processing businesses like the ones I mentioned as well as others. Processors such as wineries, breweries, distilleries, meat processing plants, uh, a cooperative, uh, Rockingham Co-op in particular, uh, cooperies, uh, we'll get into forestry industries as well with wood processing, uh, farm supply and others. Now the interest in the size and controlled environment agriculture projects and the governor's goal to be the national leader in those, along with the success and demand for more AFID funding, is leading the administration uh, toward looking for expansion of funding for AFID. So more money may be available for that in the coming years than has been before. Again, because that has a local match component to it, I hope that uh, you would look for that uh, as a possibility and let us know uh, yeah, of, of possibilities for that in your localities. Uh, I mentioned meat processing a moment ago, and that's another area of interest for us. Over 80% of Virginia's beef, uh, of, of America's beef, I'm sorry, is processed by our four largest firms. Now, the effect of COVID showed us the fragility of that meat supply in uh, that supply chain, and a consequent desire by many Virginians to acquire a local source uh, for their meat supplies and meat processing. And so VDAX is in the midst, uh, at the request of the General Assembly, of preparing a five-year strategic plan for enhanced meat production and processing in Virginia. We look forward to a productive discussion of the issues surrounding that expansion uh, in the industry, in the Commonwealth, and how to overcome some of the obstacles uh, for growth in there. And there may be opportunities for growth in that sector in your locality as well. And we'll look forward to more conversations with you if that's the case. Uh, hemp and hemp-derived food products are another area of focus for VDAX. We are enforcing some current regulations uh, regarding hemp products, uh, some of which affect Delta-8 products. Delta-8 is similar to THC, but is a, is a slight change and a different isomer. Uh, and it is because of that considered to be an adulterant in food and beverage products. It is a synthesized uh, product rather than a natural product, 
uh, in the quantities uh, that it's being sold in. And because there is not an approved manufacturing process for that, we regard it as being an adulterant if it is in a food or beverage. So uh, we have been enforcing that, and in particular, uh, we've also been assisting the uh, Attorney General's Office in uh, some of the Consumer Protection Act violations that we've also seen in some of these hemp-derived products as well, uh, including copycat trademark infringements on packaging and marketing intoxicating products uh, to children. Uh, we expect more legislation concerning hemp products to come before the General Assembly. There has been a task force working on this uh, that uh, the Secretary of Agriculture and Forestry will make a report on to the General Assembly. So we expect more uh, of that legislation coming forward in the coming session as well. Uh, another topic that we've been assisting several agencies on in considering is land use uh, and in particular regarding uh, solar projects. They, we are participating in work groups that will uh, present reports and recommendations, uh, particularly regarding potential regulation of solar projects on prime farmland. Uh, that's, that seems to be the area of most focus is when it's on prime farmland and prime soils. Uh, these areas are a few of the many topics that we're working on at BDACs and others include things like charitable gaming. Did you know part of agriculture in Virginia oversees charitable gaming. It's part of our consumer protection division. It is for now. Uh, a recent study by Jay Lark uh, is making a recommendation that as we're getting into casino gaming in Virginia as well, that casino gaming uh, go into the lottery and charitable gaming join it there uh, along with historical horse racing. We'll see what the General Assembly and the administration have with that, but that's a recommendation uh, from Jay Lark. That could affect you on the locality as well as many of you might have uh, uh, organizations in your communities that do charitable gaming and that regulation uh, might move. We're also seeing some new regulations uh, particularly regarding poker and um, uh, electronic pull tabs, electronic bingo essentially. Um, what are some other things that we're doing? We're keeping a close eye on what is called highly pathogenic avian influenza, HPAI. Uh, we, we had uh, a series of bouts with this Last year, it's an avian influenza uh, that's brought by migratory wild uh, birds um, to uh, uh, commercial and backyard flocks. Been a particular problem in Virginia, which is with backyard flocks. We have not had an instance with a commercial flock infested with avian influenza yet. If there is, because it is uh, potentially zoonotic and could be transmitted to people, and because of the, the lack of consumer confidence uh, and to make sure that we don't want to get that into um, uh, food systems, uh, uh, any, any flock with that uh, would be depopulated. And so there's, of course, a tremendous amount of anxiety with that in um, uh, the, the poultry industry. But they're doing tremendous jobs in biosecurity on that. Another one's a little further afield but could be equally or, or, or more damaging is African swine fever. We don't have African swine fever in America now, but it has been found in the Caribbean. Uh, we're trying to do everything we can to keep it out of North America. Um, and uh, uh, Rob also mentioned a minute ago, one of the things we also work on is invasive species. We, along with the Department of Forestry, have been keeping a particularly close eye on spotted lanternfly. It has been moving. Uh, from you know the northern Piedmont, more throughout the state, it can be particularly damaging to fruit crops, including apples and grapes. Uh, I could go on, but again, uh, we do want to take some time uh, for some questions. It's been a delight for me uh, to be here with you. I look forward to uh, having some more discussion both both now and uh, be able to stay around for a little while today. And uh, certainly, if there's anything more we can do to help you at any time, you can contact me directly or through Baker. Thank you very much. Um, 
Um, so, you know, I, I'll speak uh, focused on industrial scale solar. So, you know, very large uh, acreages of solar. Uh, the recent Department of Energy study found that, you know, 60% of it was going on forest land so far because in order to get that many contiguous properties, you're pretty much just looking primarily uh, at forest land, but it's a big issue for farmland as well. Um, obviously, if you, yeah, in our mind, if you get rid of forest, uh, that's a bad thing. Uh, and so uh, taking forest and turning it into solar or parking lots or data centers or whatever it is, uh, that is a, uh, yeah, it's a detriment to the forest, certainly. Um, the, House Bill 206 work group is looking at it. Again, I, I just don't see, I, I don't see a solution. We're, we're gonna have to choose solar or, you know, if we choose solar, we're gonna give up some other things and, and that's just uh, a choice we're gonna have to make as a society. Um, you know, I, I don't see it as a personal property rights issue. I mean, right now, the I, I, it's a policy issue. We are, uh, for lack of a better word, incentivizing. I don't think there's a direct incentive, but we are, through policy, putting a premium on land for solar. And so landowners are being given almost a, you know, a, a choice you can't turn down. Uh, the prices are so good for solar. So, um, you know, the landowners are doing what makes sense for them to do, but it's the society having to figure out is that really what we, what we want to do. So, and I'm, so much of the land that is necessary for the to meet the, the goals for solar energy are already leased or already have options on them. So I think this, to some degree, is somewhat of a moot point. I, I think we're, we're already, it hasn't been developed yet, but I think it's already, uh, what they need is, is already uh, under uh, option. It's a, it's a good point. Uh, I think Rob, Rob makes several good points. Uh, with that, we're, we're certainly concerned any time uh, that there could be a loss of farm or forest land and, and the reduction uh, in production, the reduction in infrastructure uh, that can lead from, lead from that. It's, it's very concerning. Uh, as Rob points out, most of, most of the projects are on private land. So then we, we have to balance that with what are the rights of, of landowners um, at the local level to make decisions of their own. But what are the rights, for example, of counties uh, to say, you know, does this fit with, uh, with where my comprehensive plan is for my county? Um, I was a supervisor for six times as long as I have been a commissioner so far. I could, I could mention some things as a, as a supervisor. Um, if I were still a supervisor, and we did a, a, a large-scale utility program in Pulaski County, a small portion of it uh, is uh, on a small portion of some land that I own. Um, if I were a supervisor, uh, I would say things like, I would want to make sure that any sort of uh, state action uh, kept land use issues that are currently a local issue is continuing to be a local issue. I would be concerned and I would want VACO uh, to make sure that uh, our voices were heard of supervisors, uh, that it continues to be something where communities and uh, counties in particular uh, get to continue to make decisions that they have been making. I wouldn't want any loss of authority from that because I think it, there's not a, a great one-size-fits-all uh, on this or any land use issue. I think it varies a lot according to uh, the different localities. If I were a supervisor, I would want to make sure that before a solar project came before me and, and I was you know, in front of the public on a dais at a public meeting, uh, that my staff had done a really good job of vetting that project. Um, a lot of these projects are not coming with uh, the ones that are renting, for example, I was talking about how much land has been rented. Uh, a lot of those don't have the capital, the financial wherewithal to actually pull off the project. Um, I want to make sure before, before I took any vote uh, on something, let's say that it's an agricultural zoned area and needs an SUP uh, to do a solar project on that area, uh, that it had the financial wherewithal uh, before staff brought it to either my planning commission or the board of supervisors. Uh, I want to make sure that any of the questions that were going to be asked about it were well answered and that staff could give good answers to those. 
there are a lot of really good environmental, uh, financial, and other questions uh, that folks will raise. And there are answers to all of those questions, but they need to be answered. And they should be answered, uh, you know, by by staff, by your whoever it might be, your, your, you know, your planning and zoning or wherever you have in that role or that capacity, uh, before they come to your planning commission or become uh, to your board of supervisors. Uh, I would want to make sure that it fit my comprehensive plan. Uh, if my comprehensive plan was calling uh, for this type of expansion or development, fine. If it wasn't, uh, I think that's a, that's a reason to say, hey, maybe this doesn't fit in our community. Uh, but there would be other other counties that would say yes. We're really looking forward uh, to having this and having the you know the benefits of this uh, investment, uh, tax revenue, uh, you know, increased rents for our landowners and other things uh, that it provides. But also understanding, uh, mitigating the the, uh, the the concerns about it, including view shed, uh, loss of farmland, and others. It is an absolute true statement uh, that you cannot mix forestry and solar panels. The trees are way too tall and get in the way. There is an ability to mix farming and solar, uh, and that might be another way in which it could uh, uh, be more palatable to some, to some localities. There can be some amount of livestock grazing, particularly with sheep. Uh, also, some amount uh, with um, uh, 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 bees and pollinators uh, and other effects that can be beneficial. See that mostly again west of the Blue Ridge, uh, east of the Blue Ridge, uh, particularly east of 95, where we have mostly cropland. Uh, you can't pick solar and corn either, but there is some amount that can be done in the livestock industry. So those would be some things that, that I would really be looking for if I were still a supervisor about uh, a solar project. We're going to watch it with a great deal of, of interest uh, at BDAX. Uh, again, the, the, the focus seems to be mostly on prime soils and prime farmland. Uh, first, we've got to come up with what exactly that means and where those are uh, and, and, and work through that as well. But I think those are just some of the topics of a very complex issue uh, that uh, I think will, will continue to be so uh, as long as we have this increased need for electricity uh, and we're looking for sources to provide. Questions from our audience? Hey, one, we had one back here to start. Yeah, you answered some of my questions, Don Rosie. Out of White County for the supervisors. Um, it is a complex issue, and uh, we work with our planning commission. And uh, what we're finding is, is we don't have enough good answers right now. Uh, to me, it's complex in the sense that uh, yeah, it has to be about a uh, part of your comprehensive plan. It's come on fast. We've got lots of folks that want to be on board, and part of it is the issue of farmers who look at the economy, look at what's going on, and they feel like, you know, I could break off 20 acres or 100 acres because they're farming maybe 2,200 acres. And this could ensure that I have my farm to hand down to my children, my children's children, because it's so tough, that's a guaranteed source of income. And oh, by the way, I don't have to do any inputs, mm -hmm. right? And we know how inputs have gone up because uh, I work in the ag industry as well. On the other side of it is, is okay, you know, how do you selectively choose where in your county these are going to go? And so uh, with VDAC, uh, you know, I would really love to see more posted as a resource from you guys uh, or hear from you some more on this. We're putting together a task force, but we're not trying to just look simply at solar either. There's the micro, micro and, and the many nuclear plants, the small little plants, and of course for a bedroom county to Hampton Roads. And we've got all the, the with the Atlantic fleet, we've got little nuclear plants all over the place sitting in the water, right? <laughs> so it is complicated, and yet uh, we also feel like, and humbly say, we don't know all the right answers. We want to see it as a part of managed growth. We feel that's very, very important. And, and we also want to understand how to work with the farmers as well. Interestingly enough, the comment came up just a couple weeks ago. I think it was, was with South Hampton County, I don't want to throw them under the bus, but uh, the, the issue was, well, we'll go ahead and allow them to put uh, solar farms on Timberland because, you know, that's not going to impact farming. And it's just like, no, 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 no. <laughs> that's not the answer either. So we really need yesterday more information, more guidance in how to put together a, a, a task force that we're putting together on energy as a whole. And, and this thing, this is a part of it. And so that's just my thoughts. And 
uh, really appreciate what you guys are saying. There's some, there, there's some really good thoughts in it. And I think if you have unanswered questions, I think the point I was making, I would want, if I were a supervisor, to have all those questions answered before I can move, before I can move forward. And I think that's, that's right. a really good uh, you know, route, route to go. And if something answered all the questions, uh, I think it's, I think it's you know, entirely appropriate to say, hey, this fits within what we're doing. And if, if you can't answer all those questions as yes, uh, you say, hey, you know what? This didn't work out. But I would. What I guess my point was, I would. I would only want those to come. Those projects to come for me if I were a supervisor, where I could answer those questions. Is yes, I would want staff to work with uh, the developer to make sure uh, that they could answer those questions uh, before they came forward. So and would would one of you guys be willing to come to one of our task force meetings to help give us some? guidance, input, and resources. I, I, we're, we're not the experts on right. solar, but to the extent that we can come and talk about uh, our land and other other uses of land, uh, we have to. But again, I, a lot of a lot of cases, it's a, it's a judgment on the part of the locality, of the individual, of the supervisor, of the project itself, uh, that, that I think go along with any sort of development project, uh, whether it be you know uh, industrial solar, or whether it be commercial, residential, industrial, or, or any other project. Uh, that you're looking at, how are you going to make best use of land in your locality? But certainly, if we can be of a help to you in um, in, in, in farmland, we we'll be happy to. We love we love Isle of Wight and what you guys are doing there with, with farming, the unique area that you have in southeastern Virginia, where we have uh, crops that we can grow there that we can't grow in the rest of the state. Yeah. You know, capital of the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Here, Michelle, thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Price, Chair Olmark, County Board of Supervisors all your comments. If I can follow up on the gentleman's comments, however, I think it is wrong to expect that every county is going to be able to have the financial resources to be able to answer the questions. That is something I think we need the state to be able to provide us some of that guidance and assistance. All of our county is fortunate. We have resources that most of the smaller counties do not have. But when you go to counties with populations 10,000 or below, for example, you cannot expect them to have the resources to be able to answer the questions that need to be answered. And we need that coming from the state. In my district, we just have right now, coming up before us, a 25-acre tract of land, 1,500 of which was pine tree farms clear cut. Mr. Farrell, I'd like to talk with you about that because we may be the 1% that did not find full compliance with protection of water and soil when that was cut and overspray on multiple occasions. 630 acres of that, which is approximately one square mile, is being proposed for solar panels, which would produce enough, enough electricity to, to supply 25,000 houses in our county if we accept what's being proposed to us. That sounds like a pretty good trade-off when you think about 726 square miles in our county and one of those can provide energy for half the houses. But all of these questions about restoration of the land, remediation, the ensuring the financial stability of the companies that are planning to do this so that they actually will be able to financially remove everything and restore the land, those are things that not every county has the financial resources to be able to answer. And we need the state to help us in that area. That's a really good point. Thank you. Well, and I think that I would, <coughs> not to kick the can down the road from the state, but I know, you know, like the, <coughs> just as an example, the Nature Conservancy is working on their map of kind of a green, yellow, red map of where solar should and shouldn't go. But not just the state, but yeah, the state should work with the NGOs or the other experts and get those kinds of answers. So could they go collect those questions, identify those questions better, and then we, as the state, identify the best folks to answer those questions? I mean, is that okay? That would be very helpful. And Mr. Guthrie, Mr. Commissioner Guthrie, in terms of some of the things you mentioned, you know, the autonomous tractors at the bargain price of $500,000. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For an average farm, and I take it that means the mean average, because we have the mean, the median, and you don't know exactly, they can't afford that. And when you talk about the vertical farming, or environment. Um, I was down in Danville and saw basically the plans for the 900,000 square foot, 15 story building for agriculture, 9 to 11 days from seed to harvest for microgreens. Small farms can't compete with that. There is absolutely no way. So what we are going to also be asking is what can the state do to help the small farmers 
you know, shop local, buy local, because that's the only way the small farm can really survive is to sell their goods into the local market, as opposed to these mega farms which can ship their goods everywhere. Yeah, and you, you make a point. I didn't. I didn't point out uh, the the. Um, uh, in the precision agriculture, while it is far more productive, because the answer was how are we producing food on less land, uh, it is only marginally more profitable, but it has become a necessity uh, for large farms. That's why we're seeing consolidation in row crop farming, because those costs have to be spread out over more and more acres. Uh, and that's why we're seeing this tremendous consolidation of, of row crop farming, particularly east of 95. And it is far different from the farming that we're seeing in the Piedmont and west of the Blue Ridge. Uh, which, which tends to be not to, but the, the cost of farming uh, is, is going uh, up and up all the time anyway, and that's maybe one of the biggest factors that we have in, in concerns of the future of farming uh, is, is, the, is, is the input cost. We saw astronomical fertilizer increases in the past year, uh, large increases in uh, prices for uh, seed and chemicals, uh, rents and others. Prices keep going up. We're very fortunate we've had a pretty good growing season we're going to get a pretty good yield for most of our crops and livestock and we're going to get pretty good prices but all of that is necessary just to offset the huge increase in uh, input cost which again keep farming for the most part only marginally if at all profitable and it is a concern because that goes back to uh, whether or not we can keep land and farming because one of the things we do we need to be not only profitable but we also I mean not only productive but we also need to be profitable in order to be prosperous to maintain and secure that into the future. Is that what you're right? Yeah, Rob, well, um, it seems that in the last 40 years, uh, you talked about the hardwood forests uh, not being as robust as they might have ordinarily have been in the past. And it appears to me, living in that western part of the state, that more and more growers, um, and when they harvested, they didn't <laughs> we can grow pine trees like you can grow corn. So the hardwoods, planting hardwoods is just economically unfeasible. So unfortunately what we've got to do is help landowners harvest in a better way, which means we need to get to them before they decide to harvest, which is a huge challenge for us to get access to those landowners and help them make better decisions. So unfortunately, yeah, it is really challenging, but we do have to do the hardwood initiative. So we do have a hardwood cost share program for landowners to do good hardwood management, just like we've always had for the plant pine tree. Right. So we're getting there slowly, but uh, yeah, it, we're working on that. Mike Hankins, former supervisor of Lindenburg County. I take care of a farm that's a little less than 200 acres, it's been in my family for about 100 years, four generations grew up on the farm. When I was a kid, it was probably about 180 acres of either pasture or probably with the sturdy farm. We have 15 or 20 acres of hardwoods because we needed and cook the wood. And that's what we got the wood from. Uh, now it's probably 60 acres of soybeans and everything else is, is uh, in, in trees. But when I got to the Board of Supervisors, you know, in Lindenburg County, we get a lot of people that come to Lindenburg County because the taxes are low, the real estate is cheap, it's a great place to live, zero crime, and the people from Richmond, Northern Virginia, the Baltimore, and where you live there, we affected the following couple years. And um, when they come to the Board of Supervisors, they get all upset because their neighbors down the road are cutting all the trees and they're gone forever. And we purchased this land because of all the trees. What can we do to educate those people? If the trees are like corn, they'll grow back and they're a crop. Today, matter of fact, they're going to be cutting 60 acres off my place that it was then when it was 15 years old and it was 
uh, then again, at 25, and it's about 35, and they're going to clear that and do a replant again in the spring. But I know my neighbors are going to be knocking on my door and saying, why did you do this to us? Yeah, I mean, I, it, as a forester, uh, it, it is discouraging to hear that argument. That, um, so in Virginia, we have cleared pretty much all the forest in Virginia. Anything that was flat enough to walk a horse on, we dug up the stumps and we turned it into cropland and we completely uh, used up the soil, abandoned it, and forest grew back. And after having forest grow on it for a couple of decades, the soil was replenished enough that we could get rid of all the trees again and put it back into agriculture again, deplete it again. So I mean, in a lot of places in Virginia, we're on our third forest. The forest is the only natural resource that I can think of that we have been able to completely exploit and deplete and have it regenerate itself pretty much all on its own. So I mean, the restorative capacity of the forest is amazing. And so it is discouraging when people disparage forestry as harmful to the environment, because it really is the only thing we have that has restored our environment after after a lot of use. Not to disparage agriculture, people were doing what they had to do uh, with the best knowledge they had at their, at, available at the, <coughs> the time. But yeah, it, it is, the only way we keep forest on the landscape is if we make forest profitable for the landowner to maintain that forest. And the best thing, sorry, again, Joey, you're just gonna have to live with me on this one. <laughs> forest is the best land use for the environment. Um, and so, you know, if we don't allow forest, the practice of forestry, we're going to have less forest, we're not going to have as healthy of an environment. How we get that message out, I don't know. I have people come to forest as soon as I leave, complaining because they're cutting the virgin timber. If you go to the cutover, you can see rows of planted pine <coughs> that these good, well meaning city folks. When, when I was a county forester, folks would call us out to see the Indian burial mounds. Well, they were the corn furrows. <laughs> it had only been in, had only been in the trees long enough that the field furrows were still there underneath. So, yeah, I'm with you. Yes, yes. Labor, particularly of trained labor, 
uh, of education uh, for people going into the meat processing industry. Uh, that expansion is difficult, expensive, uh, risky right now, high interest rates. What a lot of the uh, processors are telling us is, I'm running at full capacity, I'm making money, I've got all the work I can handle. If I expand, it would cost me an expansion and more labor. I can't find the labor, I can't build the improvement. Why would I expand? These are some great questions that would need to be answered, and they need good answers by folks who can say, hey, we can help you to become a profitable meat processor in your community, and there are ways of doing this. We've seen things like modular units for meat processing that are being manufactured uh, in North Dakota and, and can be shipped in uh, more or less just modular units put together. It can really be a cost saving. Something like that could be helpful. Uh, we're going to look at what else can be done, maybe in education, workforce development. Governor is very big on workforce development. These are longer term answers. Uh, but I think that uh, there's a lot of potential. There's actually a lot of cattle being patented in Virginia that are currently going out of state to be processed. I think a more robust meat processing industry in Virginia could be both profitable and could increase those revenues for those farms as well. Very, again, very complex issues. It, there, there's a lot of reasons why it hasn't expanded. And again, the AFID program, but I think other programs could be helpful uh, in helping uh, to make that expansion possible. If it's seen as being profitable, I think the marketplace will respond to it. The states are going to do what we can to be helpful. We were hopeful that some influx of funding from USDA for meat processing would be helpful. Unfortunately, it wasn't. Another round might be. But most of the money for USDA went not to small processors like we were looking for, but not to the top four, but to the number five through nine uh, processors, which we don't have in Virginia either.